Let's take a look at chapter 13.1 on oxidation and reduction. What uh, we're looking at here is the first topic of our new unit in electrochemistry and electrochemical changes. So, what is electrochemistry? Well, it's exactly like what you might think it is. It is the study of electrons and in particular, electron transfer as we take a look at chemical reactions. Um, something we haven't really delved into in uh, so much detail uh, up until this point in chemistry is that when you're talking about certain chemical reactions, particles are exchanged, electrons are rearranged, and we do have different atoms holding uh, different abilities to pull or attract electrons to themselves. This leads to sharing or transfer of electrons and so on and so forth. So in this unit, what we're doing is we're taking a much closer look at those single and double replacement reactions that we introduced in a most simplified concept back in Chem 10 and Chem 20. So how do we redefine these and how do we look at them in more detail? Well, electrochemistry is going to be a series of two what are known as half reactions. There is a species or a group of atoms that are going to be oxidized and there's going to be a group that gets reduced. Now, what exactly does all this mean? Well, first thing that we want to be able to uh, put together here is that oxidation and reduction must happen together. I cannot have one without the other. Okay, so if something is going to gain electrons, then something else had to lose them. All right, so they are two half processes or half reactions that make the overall uh, electron exchange possible. Okay, we simplify this and we call it redox. Okay, and so we do know that we can't have one without the other. It, let's say something that we would have seen like this in the past would be taking a look at magnets. There's no such thing as a magnet with only a north pole. Conversely, there's no such thing as a magnet with only a south pole. They both, any magnet you look at will have a north and a south or opposite poles. All right, there's no such thing as that monopole magnet. Therefore, if we extend that sort of logic where one begets the other, then we have oxidation and reduction. Oxidation begets reduction in order to have a full redox reaction. All right, so single and double replacement are kind of gone, and we're going to be replacing it with this process called oxidation and reduction. So what is reduction? For this, we have a bit of an issue with um, what words mean. Whenever I say something like reduction, like I'm going to reduce your grade in Chem 30, number one, you're going to get really upset. And number two, um, you're going to think that I'm lowering your mark. When actually, if I took an electrochemical approach, I would be gaining or improving your mark if I was to reduce it. Well, but hey, check what, heck, what the heck do you mean by that one? So reduction is a name given to a process before we knew what the electron was. All right, we've been uh, dealing with ores and metals and stuff like that for you know thousands of years. And only in the last couple hundred have we known exactly why metals, metal ions, and metal ores actually exist. And it has to do with how they hold their electrons. So what was reduction? Reduction was associated with producing metals from their compounds. And if I give you this example here where we have tin 4 oxide, it reacts with carbon to produce elemental tin and some carbon dioxide. Reduction was that process by which we produced pure metals. And so why did they come up with this name reduction to describe this process? Well, think about the tin ore that you would have gathered here. Tin with all those extra oxygens in a solid form would be much heavier compared to the lighter tin that I would have refined from this. So if you look at it from the point of view by which this process was being run, you got your smelting plants and things like that, and you take a thousand pounds of tin for oxide ore, or the tin ore that you know you get that from, and you only produce 600 pounds of tin, you would say that the weight of your ore has been reduced, or the weight of the tin was always less than what you got it from. So in the metallurgical, rea metallurgical reaction, pardon me guys, all right, we looked at this from the point of view of weight. And this was run for hundreds to thousands of years, reducing the weight of metallic ores to pure metals. And then we discovered the electron. So in Chem 30, what we have to adjust to really quickly is that the process of reduction actually means 
to gain electrons. And we'll build upon that one as we continue through chapters 13.1, 13.2, and 13.3. Okay, so we just have a little bit of a semantics problem here, is that this was a historical process and it had been run this way for hundreds of years. And then trying to change that perspective is a little bit difficult. The name stuck even though we had to adjust and evolve our definition as to what was going on with respect to the electrons. So we remember right away that reduction in chem 30 is talking about the gain of electrons for a species. In other words, it's going to be reducing its charge or becoming more negative. Oxidation, when you see that word, may, most of us would typically think of oxygen. And well, oxygen is often involved in the oxidation process when we see things like combustion, that's actually a redox process. Corrosion and the rusting of metals is a redox process. And oxygen is almost always a player in those two things. However, in Chem 30, we do have to expand this because as we learned more about the electrochemistry, we realized that there were more things that could play a role in this oxidation process. And it didn't necessarily require oxygen. Why does oxidation remain as the name for this? Because the first ones we did and our first understandings of this usually involved oxygen. And so the belief was that only oxygen caused this process. We now know that oxidation is the process by which a substance will lose electrons. And there are lots of other different species out there that like to take electrons from other things, such as fluorine, the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. Okay, so what we have done is we've learned two terms. And it should be important by now at this point in Chem 30 that our understanding really is dependent upon knowing what words mean. Okay, enthalpy talked about changes in potential energy. Heat transfer and thermal energy changes was reference to kinetic energy in the last unit. And if we were struggling with all those various synonymous terms, it made the concepts difficult. So spend time immediately in this unit memorizing the idea that reduction means the gain of electrons and that oxidation means the loss of electrons. Okay, this will take some reading, this will take making some flashcards, this will take lots of repetition, but the sooner we know that these two words, reduction and oxidation, mean gain and loss of electrons respectively, the happier we'll be going forward. Now there is another point of view that we can take a look at it, Reduction simply means the gain of electrons, so the substance had to gain them. We can also talk of this, about this from a point of view of agency. And so we can talk about things like reducing agents. And your agent is the substance that causes something else to be reduced. We notice that tin oxide here in our previous example, all right, was reduced to pure tin. Okay, well, if this had to gain electrons to be reduced, to exist as elemental tin, because don't forget, in tin-4 oxide, this is tin-4+, plus, and this is just elemental tin, which of course has an equal balance of protons and electrons. So we had to gain four electrons in order to reduce to elemental tin. Where on earth did we get these electrons from? Well, it had to be from the other species in this chemical equation. Carbon's the only other thing involved in this reaction that could possibly supply electrons to tin, since oxygen already has them in the compound, in order to break that bond and allow tin to exist as a single element. So we often talk about agency or the other substance in the compound as the agent of a particular process. In this case, carbon is the reducing agent, which of course caused or allowed for the reduction of tin for ions to elemental tin. It's kind of like the flip side of the same coin. All right, we are still talking about electrochemistry. In one way, we can talk about the processes of oxidation reduction, or we can flip the coin and we can look at it from a different point of view and we can talk about the agency or the substances that cause this. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but there will be processes and predicting of products and chemical reactions we're going to look at as we go through this unit. And in some cases, it's going to make sense to look at it from the point of view of the process of reduction or oxidation. We'll be able to track that a little bit easier. And in other cases, it'll make more sense to look at the substances or the other compounds causing these processes. And we'll look at it from an agency point of view. 
Okay. And as we go through these individual things, we'll talk about why one is better than the other in a particular case. So we're going to lose, look, uh, lose, look at two different ways in order to be able to get these reactions understood. One is the process. The other is agency. So if there's a reducing agent, then there must be an oxidizing agent. And this is the substance that promotes the oxidation or the loss of electrons uh, for a particular substance. All right. If oxidation is to lose electrons, then something must be taking those electrons. And for this, we could take a look at another example here. All right. You can see that aluminum being elemental here is going into ionic compound with aluminum chloride. And so aluminum being elemental is neutral. Aluminum in aluminum chloride is Al3+. Well, that certainly looks like aluminum lost three electrons. So who did it lose them to? Well, chlorine, a fairly electronegative atom on our periodic table, is a likely culprit to take them. And so we could talk about chlorine being the oxidizing agent here because it was the substance that took or caused aluminum to lose its electrons. So again, aluminum is oxidized, but it's chlorine that is the oxidizing agent. So there's your two slight different perspectives there. For this, all right, uh, I don't have any clean sheets here, so you're using one that I've already discussed with the class here, but please read 558 to 560 in your textbook. There is lots of discussion here as to why we have these antiquated terms for uh, taking a look at electrochemistry. And it really just kind of boils down to we got very used to a couple of names industrially and um, chemically for hundreds of years, and there's a lot of resistance to change. Like, for example, I called this aluminum. It's really aluminum, but in North America, we've called it aluminum since I started studying chemistry and many years before that. So while it is truly aluminum, we still call it aluminum. It's a hard nickname to break down. Same thing happened for oxidation and reduction. So to help with that one, please read through 558 to 560 and answer these questions. What are some of the examples of redox reactions? And I would write down some of those examples. Empirically, when did redox chemistry begin? And then finally, what is the origin of these processes of redox um, in the reduction and oxidation? And if you can take some time with this one, it'll make sense as to why we have these eh, kind of confusing words to describe the process but they make sense when you look at how they were derived. Okay, go forward with that one, and I will see you in lesson two as we talk more about this electron transfer theory.